needs to be considered as well. Now, on to the plain packaging side of the story. So the history within the plain packaging um, side of the development was uh, um, an implementation that was done in Australia where they went to plain packaging. Now, the outcomes of that were uh, twofold. One, there was a slight reduction in the number of people smoking tobacco. I believe it was 100,000 people less smoking tobacco over a three-year period. But there was an increase in contraband. Okay, so in Australia, they are in a different situation. They don't produce their own um, tobacco, so they're importing everything. But within that, the contraband uh, grew from 10 to 26 percent. So that was concerning, especially as we look at how that compares to Canada. We have quite a contraband problem in the tobacco industry in Canada. And in fact, in Ontario, it's estimated that 40 to 60 percent of the cigarettes that are being sold are contraband. And I know in my own riding, there are smoke shops literally everywhere throughout the riding where you can go and buy illegal contraband tobacco. And this is something that's simply not being enforced by the police today. Uh, many of the First Nations um, um, areas in my riding are the ones that are um, putting forward this product. And so I understand the sensitivity of that. But certainly, if we're going to go to plain packaging, there are some consumer health considerations because there have been numerous complaints about the content going into some of this contraband tobacco. Uh, we've heard stories of, from, you know, dirt and sweepings, um, uh, animal manure. I mean, there's been a number of, you know, troubling things. And from a quality control point of view, I think it was pointed out earlier that if the, the cigarette has absolutely no markings on it, then you have no idea whether it was made by uh, a well-regulated industry that we have today in the, on the tobacco side or whether it was just made, you know, in somebody's barn. So that's a concern for me because I think we have a lot of regulation in every other area of food and drugs and, and this should be no different. The, um, the other thing that I think is, is sort of um, hypocritical on the part of the government has to do with the discussion that I participated in on the health committee with respect to marijuana and whether or not plain packaging would be appropriate for marijuana. Now the, the way the discussion went on that one was to start out with, the um, organized crime is already participating in this market. And they have lovely packaging with all kinds of colors and people are becoming brand loyal, especially in the edible market. And um, the idea was that if you introduce plain packaging, it would not be competitive with what's already in place with organized crime. And so the discussion was that they wouldn't move to plain packaging there. So I don't know how you could make that argument on that side and not make the same argument on the tobacco side where we have a 40% contraband market in Ontario and I believe it's about 30% across the country. So certainly that bears a little bit of discussion because what you're really talking about is uh, competing harms, right? The harm reduction that you're going to get in smoking from going to plain packaging versus the harm increase from not knowing and not having quality control on that product plus the harm from the organized crime interaction. So, you know, you have to take a, a bit of a holistic view um, when we look at that. Now, there are a number of um, organizations that are weighing in on this legislation, and I think uh, the Canadian Cancer Society and Heart and Stroke, you know, we do look to them for their input on this. Um, and this is a, a quote from the Canadian Cancer Society where they say that they applaud the federal government's commitment to implement plain and standardized packaging for tobacco and are writing to encourage speedy adoption of regulations. Plain packaging for tobacco products would prevent tobacco companies from using packs as many billboards promoting tobacco. Despite the fact that smoking rates have declined by more than half, tobacco use remains the leading preventable cause of disease and death in Canada killing 37,000 Canadians every year. Um, deeply concerned by Canada's unacceptable high rates of smoking, especially among youth. Health Canada's tobacco strategy expires in March 2018. I urge you to strengthen this strategy through better funding to allow for stronger initiatives and greater impact through modernization of the outdated Federal Tobacco Act that's almost 20 years old and through the speedy adoption of plain packaging regulations. 
So I, I think we see from these organizations that um, they see some merit in plain packaging, but obviously they would share the similar concerns about controlling the quality. And um, it may be that we do want to have some kind of a mark on the cigarettes that is a government approved mark. That, that would at least uh, allow the consumer to differentiate between something that is um, contraband and something that's not. That said, we know that organized crime is quite clever and whenever we will put a mark on something, they can easily copy it. We see that we even have counterfeit money that happens. So um, that may not fix that concern overall. Now, uh, some of the other things I want to talk about um, has to do with uh, some of the recommendations that are specific to the packaging, where there is discussion about having an optional alphanumeric code used for product identification. Um, I think it should actually not be an optional code, because what this would mean is there would be a, a number system on each cigarette that, with letters referring either to Canada or the province or territory where it's sold. So AB for Alberta, maybe, or uh, you know, CA overall or ON, CAON for Canada, Ontario. So I, I think having a, a set of numbers, that would be another prevention tactic that you could use to try to keep contraband out of the market and is worth um, considering. The um, current S5 also um, does not allow the tobacco industry to introduce these harm reducing products that they are coming forward with under the vaping legislation. They're required to be under the tobacco legislation, which is more onerous from a, a product introduction point of view, getting products approved, getting products added to the list. The amount of scientific evidence that you have to bring about uh, the health and um, uh, other impacts, environmental impacts. So I would say that there needs to be a fair playing field between both of those. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about marijuana, because the government is intending to legalize this in July of 2018. So it seems to me that if we're addressing regulations and trying to modernize regulations about smoking, and they've decided even though you know, they want to reduce smoking, for some reason they've added marijuana smoking to the list of things that we want to do, it just seems like a totally hypocritical approach. But I'm certain that they would want to bring amendments to this bill that would include marijuana so it's clear because people are vaping marijuana and they're smoking marijuana. And you know, both of those are, are harmful. We've seen the Canadian Medical Association clearly come out with studies that show the harm to young people as their brains are developing, that we would see a 30% increase in schizophrenia, psychotic disorders, depression, anxiety, and addiction in young people that consume marijuana once a week for example. So I think um, if we're talking about reducing overall 